has a straight edge on it, so it's very easy. And maybe in our world here, there lives a happy little mountain. Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Caitlin and I upload a whole bunch of different types of videos on this channel, usually surrounding sort of true crime, mystery, unsolved disappearances, I even do psychological experiment videos. So um, if that sounds like something you enjoy, then definitely head over to my channel and check out my other videos. Today we are back discussing another unsolved case. This is the unsolved murders of three members of the Sims family in Florida. So as always with these videos, please bear in mind that due to the nature of the videos they are explicit and they don't contain um, very nice information so if you don't think that that is something that you should be watching then definitely click off this video because I like to share as much of the facts and the research as I can um, due to I just think each of these victims should have their full case heard and so yeah please bear that in mind when watching my videos but if you want to hear a little bit more information about the murders of the sims family then keep on watching and we shall just get started the sims family's case takes place in october of 1966 in tallahassee florida their family was made up of dr robert sims who was 42 and his wife helen sims who was 34. they had three children virginia who was 17 judith ann who was 16 and then the youngest was joy lynn who was 12 years old at the time. They were a well-known family in their community, in their local area. They were often described as just being a kind family, very religious family, so they were well liked and well known amongst their community. They were a very well known family around their community, they lived in a sort of smaller community um, and many people described them as being kind and very religious, so no one really had anything against them, they weren't controversial, they were just well known and well liked. On October 22nd, 1966, Dr. Robert, his wife Helen and their youngest daughter Joy Lynn were inside their home on Muriel Court Drive. The two eldest daughters were out of the house, they were babysitting in homes not too far from their own home, so they were expected to return home late but their parents knew exactly where they were. And then at around 11.15pm that night, Virginia, the 17 year old daughter of the Sims, returned home to her home on Muriel Court Drive and discovered a gruesome, gruesome scene. So as she entered her home, she found no sign whatsoever of any of her family members, even her younger sister. So she ended up looking around the rooms and ultimately ended up heading towards the master bedroom. Inside the master bedroom, she discovered the bodies of Robert, Helen and their daughter Joy Lynn. Robert was laying on the bed. He was dressed in shirt, trousers, he was fully clothed. He had been shot once in the head, but he was still alive barely. Virginia found her mother lying on the carpet next to Joy Lynn and her mother had been wearing again fully clothed. She was in a blouse and trousers. Helen had been shot twice in the head and once in the leg, but she too was still Still alive. Joy Lynn was found wearing her nightdress lying next to her mother. She had been shot once in the head and stabbed six times in the torso and sadly she was found dead on arrival. Each of the Sims family members had been bound and gagged with a number of the kind of various household items that have obviously just been found around the house by the perpetrator so they used things like nightdresses, lingerie, socks, ties, anything that they could to bound and gag these poor, poor victims. So Virginia, upon discovering this awful scene, her poor family members and what they'd been through, her first move was to call a place called the Bevis Funeral Home. And this was kind of common practice to, in the area, it was known that if you wanted an ambulance rather than calling emergency services, that the Bevis Family Funeral Home would respond quicker with their own ambulance. So that was what she did. Um, some people have pointed out that it seems strange that she didn't call an ambulance. But like I said, this was completely common practice. It was what they were told to do because they were told that the Bevis family would respond much quicker than emergency services would. So two members of the Bevis family, upon receiving this call from Virginia, uh, they jumped in their ambulance and they drove straight to the home. They arrived pretty soon after um, the initial call was placed, but unfortunately Dr. Sims was found dead just after they arrived. Helen was taken straight to hospital and kept under close watch. When doctors had inspected her, they found that one of the bullets that had been shot into her brain was actually way too deep. Um, it dislodged itself and it became so deep in her brain that they couldn't remove it without 
any potential further injuries. And so because of this, they couldn't really do much but place her on a respirator to help her with breathing and keep her in a state of unconsciousness. When investigators searched the Sims family home, they found no sign of robbery motive, of a break-in, there was no forced entry. Um, so everything around the house was still there nothing had been taken there were small piles of cash just found around on like side tables and things that were left untouched there was also a really expensive coin collection that was found untouched as well so all these signs suggest that it was some other motive aside from robbery they went around checking each of the neighbors to see if any of them had heard or seen anything that could be potentially useful in identifying who had killed the three family members um, and only one of their neighbors from Muriel Court Drive actually heard anything. The neighbour claimed that around 10.45pm they heard a loud scream but initially at the time they hadn't thought anything of it because they knew that they had a number of children in the house so they thought that perhaps it was just children playing um, and didn't think it was anything strange and so didn't necessarily pay attention to it. The first investigator that arrived at the crime scene of the Sims family home was a man named Larry Campbell and there is a huge, huge issue around him and the way that he carried out this investigation. I won't go too much into it because there is a lot and a lot of people speculate, but because it was so long ago, we don't know just how much of it is fact, but what we do know is that at the time when he arrived on the scene, he did not set up a secure crime scene. He didn't corner it off, he didn't mark any of it off, so he let people walk in and out of the house looking for things, ultimately contaminating any potential evidence that they could find. I have a quote here from a man named Rocky Bevis. He was 16 years old at the time and he was actually in the ambulance. He was accompanying his father when they came and picked up the ambulance in response to Virginia's call. So he said, they went in and made coffee. It was probably textbook what you shouldn't do. In hospital, Helen Sims survived for nine days without even waking up. And then sadly, on October 31st, 1966, she passed away. The night that Helen Sims died, Tallahassee officials made the really controversial decision to ban or cancel any form of trick-or-treating happening that night since it was Halloween, as they were sort of implementing it in order to protect their residents. From their perspective, they were aware that a seemingly aggressive and short-tempered attacker had carried out these gruesome murders, but they hadn't any sign of who he was yet. In fear of any future tragedies, they decided to prevent anyone from going out that night. Police investigators chose to continue their search by searching any sort of nearby woodland area. There was a pond behind the Sims family home. They searched all of these places but found no evidence of who had done anything. They hadn't found any sort of murder weapon, anything like that. So still no answers. One particularly notable theory that people often reference when talking about this case is um, something that was followed up by the police officials at the time. So because they were kind of at their wits end, they had no evidence to suggest anyone as the perpetrator. So they followed down this theory that potentially the perpetrator may have been inspired by a book by a man named Truman Compote, who I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, a book that he wrote called In Cold Blood. The book has a seemingly quite similar storyline where the members of a family called the Clutter family were killed while their two eldest children were out the house. It seems kind of quite far-fetched but also there are some similarities so officials at the time, some of them in particular, um, believed that the similarities were too too strange to ignore so they followed down this route and they even they looked at the public library in Tallahassee, they went through the list of people who had taken out the book um, in recent years and interviewed them to see if any of them had any particular motive but again this brought up no new leads. Police even interviewed everyone who came in close contact with the Sims family uh, in recent days leading up to the murders including the maid, there were people that it was even like the piano tuner so they literally followed up everyone that would have come into contact with them but again found nothing. One issue that they found was that while they were trying to sort of come across their potential suspect list they found that earlier in the day before the murders took place there were a number of things that brought a lot of strangers so a lot of non-residents into Tallahassee so there was a huge football game going on there was also a fair there was a massive fair that was going on so a lot of strangers passing through the town so by the time the murders took place there were still thousands of people that they had no names for that were in the town and because of this their potential suspect pool had widened dramatically but again because they had no solid leads um, very soon into the investigation there were a lot of rumors from the actual residents in the area 
Um, they've kind of been coming up with their own theories because like I said, there was no idea of who could have potentially done this. And like I said earlier, they were seemingly well-liked, non-controversial family. So residents started gossiping and one particular theory uh, kept cropping up and it was kind of like the mainly gossiped theory. So this popular theory implicated a man who was actually the pastor in the town. So this man's name was Pastor Cecil Albert Roberts. And like I said, he was the pastor in town. He was actually Helen Sims's previous employer from when she worked at Tallahassee's first Baptist church. She worked as a secretary there and just a couple days before her death, she quit her job. So a lot of theories kind of began, like gossip began circulating. People began piecing together the fact that she had quit just a few days before her murder and also the fact that Pastor Roberts was known as quite a ladies man. I think he was quite a young sort of attractive uh, well-liked man and these rumours started piecing together these facts as being related. However when police looked into this theory they found that the pastor did actually have a really solid alibi for the night. He was the chaplain for the team playing in the large football game that I mentioned earlier in town. So there is video footage of the game um, where he was seen throughout pretty much. He was, like I said, he was the chaplain for the team. So they determined that he wouldn't have had enough time in between these clips to go and commit these murders. Ultimately, they ruled out any sort of suspicion of his involvement in this crime. But because of the amount of extreme gossip um, throughout the residence, he ultimately actually quit his job and moved because he was just absolutely scapegoated. One really strange piece of evidence that actually came out just about a day or two after the crime came from a woman who had claimed that around uh, the day after the murders she had been trying to place a call on something called a party line. So a party line is kind of like a shared service line on the phone. A number of local telephone service users would have used this line. It was kind of just like a shared line um, where you can't hear full conversations but she ended up hearing snippets of a conversation the next day after the murders took place. So she heard this stranger's voice and heard him say something along the lines of, mother, I have just done a horrible thing. I have killed three persons. So she could conclude that he was a young man. She didn't know his voice, she didn't recognize him, but it was particularly notable that he spoke with a really strange diction. So due to the fact that this was occurring in 1966, there was obviously a lot less advanced technology going on. So the telephone company, when obviously they followed up this potential lead, they could only um, narrow down the potential caller to one of 200 people. They did know, however, that the call was placed from a place called Brevard, Brevard County, which from Tallahassee would have taken about five hours to drive. So because of this, it would have been extremely likely that whoever had placed this call, if he had been involved in the murders, then police ne would have never sort of thought to chase him down because they had no idea who he was. They hadn't looked at anyone that far away. It was just someone that was a complete stranger. So when you try and look up sort of uh, news reports, media reports at the time, there's a lot of contradiction about the information they share regarding the potential sexual motive about the crimes. So some newspapers had released that there was a sexual, there was an element of sexual molestation involved. So some even claimed that they had insider knowledge that Joylin's pants were found around her ankles and there had been a molestation involved, but we don't know how much of that is true because there was no sort of official record of it in the files. Despite this sort of contradiction, this speculation, it seemed that the investigators were very, very keen to rule out any sort of robbery or money related motive and also any sexual related motive. And apart from this, there wasn't really much else in the initial investigation that could be found. They kind of tried, they didn't find any leads or anything. So it wasn't until the year of 1980 when the case was reopened by the Leon County Sheriff's Department that they found sort of some potential new suspects. There was a man on death row. He was a death row inmate whose name was actually never released. They didn't release his name, so we don't know who exactly it is, but he became quite a potential or high suspect in this case. So according to reports, the crimes that he was already on death row for that he committed had been uncannily similar to the murders of the Sims family. This paired with the fact that he was active in Florida around the time of the Sims family murders, it became more and more likely that he had been a potential perpetrator. However, again, no definitive conclusions could be reached from this information. So another suspect that was considered during the investigation was a man, he was a young man, He, I think he was the son of a criminology professor 
um, he actually lives in the house behind the Sims's home. When he became a suspect, the investigators learned that he at the time had had a girlfriend who had a quite well known and quite notable obsession with death. So again, there was a lot of sort of strange things around this particular uh, lead because he was never questioned, but his girlfriend was. I don't know why, don't ask me why, but it was a lot of strange sort of questions around how they carried that out. During the interview of the girlfriend of this potential suspect, she referred to things um, like a dream she had that had taken place inside the Sims family home, which in itself was questionable because no one was ever sure if she'd actually ever been inside the Sims family home. She'd also been quoted saying things during this interview like, how could he be interested in that ugly little girl and my god that kid with her clothes off lying on the floor, my god. Which most people assumed is sort of in reference to the young victim, Joy Lynn. So at the time, obviously, there was no official record of any sexual molestation. So when this interview took place, they didn't see it as any strange. But like I said, it becomes more and more questionable about um, whether this means anything now that there is the potential factor of a sexual motive. And then in 2014, the initial investigator of the Sims family case, Larry Campbell, died with uh, still no answers to this case. Since then, there have been a number of people coming forward claiming to have known someone or have had some information about who could have potentially carried out these awful murders, but nothing conclusive has come forward. So as always with these sort of things, especially over time, it becomes harder and harder to tell who is credible and who's not. So like I said, this case is still unfortunately cold. There are no current answers, um, but hopefully, I really genuinely do hope that this is something that investigators can still pursue if they can. So yeah, that is all the information I have for you today on the murders of the Sims family. I hope you guys found it interesting. Let me know down below what sort of theory you think is likely. I, With this one, it's very strange because it happened so long ago, there isn't a lot of public record about it. Um, but I, I, it's so strange that something like this could happen and there'd be no sign of who did it and no reason to. Yeah, so let me know what you think down below and uh, let me know any requests you have. Also follow me on all of my social media. You can drop me a DM, you can drop me a request, anything. And yeah, thank you so much for watching. I hope you found it interesting and I'll see you guys soon for another video. Bye.